It's going to be a very important show because I think by now people are kind of realizing for the first time that printing money doesn't work, you know, and that's their only solution they got left. We come with different solutions. As they say, demography is destiny. So when you watch what the demographics are doing, you can almost predict the future. It's what's happening with the people is the future. And we're now in a triple bubble. We have a real estate bubble, stock market bubble, and bond bubble. I think people are finally waking up that something might be wrong. $300 trillion, give or take, disappears in financial assets and doesn't come back for a long time. That's the big news. By my demographic analysis, the greatest boom in history. When I was predicting this in the 80s, people thought I was crazy that the U.S. could do so well. They thought Japan and Asia was going to take over the world. I said, no, we still have a giant, one of the best baby booms in history coming along, and they're going to spend and earn a lot of money, and we're going to have the greatest boom in history from 1983 right. to 2007. And then 2008, of course, it did go down. And I predicted that 20-some years would happen, okay? But forget that. That caused a shock to the con. And then governments have been printing money ever since. Now, to print money for a year to overcome a strong downturn like 2008-9, oh, I'd agree with that. One year of money printing. To be printing money 13, 14 years and escalating and printing and fiscal stimulus combined after COVID for two years, $10 trillion, half of GDP, is insanity. <laughs> so this shows how crazy things have gotten. Governments we should have had, my forecast all the way back to the 80s when I started with my generation cycles and technology cycles every 45 years, the generation are more like 38, 39. And we have the greatest boom in history, but it would slow after 2007 and not come back with the millennials until about 2023, 24. Well, what we have now is we have the greatest bubble in history because governments fought the slowdown after 2008, which was very serious and would have been more serious and should have lasted into 2010, much like the 29 to 32 collapse. They just bubbled up financial assets. They haven't changed, you know, incomes and stuff. They bubbled up financial assets, which means the rich, which were already getting richer in the greatest bubble boom in history, got even richer. And everyday people are still struggling. And now we have an economy. And, and I've been warning for years. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's happening now. You can't do this forever. You can't just print money and grow an economy past its fundamentals of when what I study better than I think anybody in the world. When do people earn and spend money over their life cycle? What's the life cycle of people and how do generations, particularly the largest in history, at least the largest in 250 years, the baby boom generation, affect that boom and bust? And we are still in the bust wake of the baby booms peak into 2023, 24, before we can grow through natural causes. And I see that this government printing scheme is now failing, despite printing more and more, failing anyway, because you can't do this forever, and it's going to collapse, which is just in time for us to balance out the economy so we can grow again with the millennial generation from 2024 forward. So I'm happy to see this collapse. I'm happy to see a downturn, damn it. We should have had a bigger one in 2008, 9, and 10 and got rid of most of this bad debt. Now we have more bad debt than ever. We're going to get rid of it in the next few years. It's going to be painful. So you and I agree on the causes and symptoms and what's happening. We have the most common sense approach. <laughs> I mean, it's not only factual, it's common sense that you can't just grow by printing money out of thin air. I mean, how common sense is going to be than that? Printing money since 2009. This is insanity. You know what? Who are the most insane people in the world? People who get high. OK, it doesn't matter whether it's heroin or crack or alcohol. People get high and then they do stupid stuff because their brain stops. Working. The whole world is high on nonstop stimulus since 2009. And this will not end well. You weren't around from late 29 to 42 when it went <laughs> down lower and lower and did not get back to even until 1953, 25 years late. It's called smoking crack. We're bouncing out of that. It's okay. not that strong a bounce, by the way. I don't think it's going to last past this month if it has not already peaked. Uh, the proof of my concept, and I think Robert's here, obviously, if we see another wave down, which would be the logical thing, forget everything we're saying. If I'm just looking as a stock chartist, we had this first crash, 
a tepid bounce, and we have another one of the same magnitude, we're going to see uh, 73.50, you know, on the NASDAQ down more than 50% by late this year, okay. early next year. And then people are going to know something is really wrong. And that's for the baby boomers, because we were the yeah. boom generation. 1974, the government passed ERISA, which became the 401k, which is the biggest Ponzi scheme I ever saw. And now they're pulling the rug out from all the baby boomers. So the baby boomers are toast. So they were the boom. Now they're the bust. How come people don't know this? What blocks them from knowing? You believe what you want to believe because you want to believe it. The baby boom did cause, and I was the first one to say it, and it took me to the mid-80s. I didn't get it in 1982, for it. This generation is going to go into their peak spending cycle all the way into 2007. Greatest boom in history. Going to make the 50s and 60s Bob Hope generation look like nothing, but then it's going to crack. Okay. So that's the problem now. It did crash, and the bigger problem is government said, well, we're not going to let it crash. And I'm like, who the hell are you? A bunch of politicians that never did anything for a living, most of you, and say, oh, we're just not going to let the economy do what the economy will do to correct an imbalance of overinvestment in bubbles and financial assets and bring them down to normal so we can grow again. They're fighting it. And I said the biggest crash was coming. It's here now. And they're still fighting it, and it's still going to happen anyway. It's going to get worse than people think, even now when it's finally starting, go down despite. Why do they believe these guys like Jim Cramer? Whatever Kramer predicts, you go short. But he's a smart idiot. He just <laughs> entertains. He has nothing to do with the truth. All I do is research what happens in history, what causes things and what doesn't. And that's the truth. You do not get a bubble like this. There has been no bubble any time in all of history that has not burst badly and rapidly when it does. And it's already started. One of the problems is people choose the wrong profit. They choose what they want to hear. If yes. you're in a boom and you're invested in the boom, I mean, everyday people didn't used to have so much money in stocks. It was more in real estate. And real estate does not go down like stocks. Though. Real estate is more stable even when it goes down. And everybody now has to root for this thing to keep going. And so they'll listen to the people that say, oh, no, don't worry about this. Don't worry about debt levels. Don't worry about demographics declining, which they're declining at the speed of light in all developed countries in the world. Somehow the government will bring us out of it. The millennials bring us up through natural causes instead of printing money from 2024. And I'm very precise about this. I said from the beginning, the baby boom thing was going to peak in late 2007. I said that in the 80s. That's how predictable people earning and spending money as they age are in generational surges. And the baby boom was a big surge. So, of course, a great boom. The millennials do not bring the upward natural momentum until 2024, and they will peak by 2037, much shorter boom than the baby boom. Boomers were like 46 to 64 was a boom generation. There was a Gen X peak behind us. Noticeably from 1937 into 61. That's the rising baby boom, which on a lag, predictable, quantifiable lag for peak spending at 46, moving towards 47, would have given us a peak in late 2007. I've been preaching that since the 80s. People back then were saying, Harry, you're crazy. The U.S. is done. Asia's taking over. Japanese make us look like idiots, you know? And I'm like, yeah, they're growing and they're going to grow longer, but we still have the greatest baby boom in the world and we're going to have the greatest boom in history until 2007 and then it's going to clap. Who is Gen X and what's their challenge now? Because that's a large generation. Gen X is the declining birth rates from 1961 into 73 to 75 that caused the slowdown from 2008 still into 2022-23 before the millennials born after them take it up. And even the millennials, here's the important point. Nobody gets this, okay? Even the millennials with their spending power as a smaller generation, less long in birth, only take us back to where the baby boomers took us. We only get back to even adjusted for rising productivity. We will never see a boom like 1983 to 2000 again in the U.S. And most of the developed world will never. And Europe's okay. already behind us. What's going to happen to Gen X? Because they're the sandwich right now. They're the spread. Oh. Well, they're causing the slowdown, but they kind of benefit because when asset prices go down eventually, which they are yet, when they do finally crash, they're going to be able to invest at more reasonable prices again and be able to invest for retirement. I tell you, anybody right now, 
in the markets, whether it be bond markets at the lowest interest rates ever long term or stock markets, the highest valuation. If you invest today, even with no predictions of up and down economy, you're likely to make a couple percent a year for the rest of your life. You're not going to be able to retire profitably until the markets come down to reality and you can invest at fair asset prices again. This is a new trend everywhere. It's a good trend. People don't have to spend an hour or two commuting every day and sitting in the car. It's only more productive, okay? It's just that the millennials are causing with less spending than the baby boomers who already peaked at age 46 to 47 before them. They're causing a slowdown. And instead of governments helping to restructure debt, we've got Tons of bad debt now from the great boom from 83 to 2007 that needs to be restructured. They're encouraging people to keep that bad debt in place and not to reinvest in new industries and stuff. They're doing all the wrong things because they don't want to have a recession. You know what recession is to me? Sleep. Try not sleeping for three days and not become a crazy person. It's already proven. Three to five days, no sleep, you'll become a crazy person. We have to grow and expand all the innovation of the past, and we have to slow again and restructure and cut out losing companies and losing things and reinvest in the future. And governments are interrupting the free market capitalist system that has made us the richest and the greatest advance since the late 1700s in all of history because they don't want to have a damn recession. Greatest boom in history, and just when it needs to restructure, they screw it up so we can never grow again because okay. we never okay. restructure okay. bad debt. We got through the problem. A lot of it's just mismanagement of debt and printing money to solve problems and all this. All of this stimulus on top of the greatest demographic boom in history, but which did start to fail. So all the stimulus throws money into the economy. What do governments do with this? Stim- they buy financial assets. They start with bonds, but the more money goes in bonds, it will trickle into higher valuation stocks and real estate because that's where the returns are. So what we have now, and I got a number on this, it's close to $600 trillion dollars in financial assets globally. That's about seven times global GDP at 95 trillion. And normally financial assets are a premium two, maybe three times. So the biggest problem in the world is all financial assets, even bonds. And when you have a crash like this, when these financial assets start to crumble, the money has to go somewhere. It goes into the safest areas. So it is the income producing real estate, multifamily mostly, and it is the treasury bonds, the highest quality government bonds. If the U.S. government can print enough money to keep a dumb bubble going, they'll certainly print money to pay their (laughs) bonds off, their treasury bonds, okay? You don't have to worry about a default on 30 or 10-year treasury bonds. And again, I go back and say, okay, let's look at 2008. When I look at the 2008 crisis, that was like 1929 to 32 coming in, except this time, massive stimulus which they didn't do back then, so they come out of it, okay? But that's when you see things go down, financial assets go down, flirting with deflation. This time we're going to deflate more because they've tried to pump it up and it's failing anyway, so financial assets keep falling. The money has to go somewhere, so what it goes, it goes into the safest bonds and the highest quality real estate, which is the people, again, the people who are renting real estate, multifamily, the people who will need it more than ever, even people who would rather buy, can't buy in a bad market and hard to get loans. Who's the best house in a bad neighborhood? Is Europe in trouble? Yes. Has Japan been in trouble forever? Yes. Okay. U.S. is still the best house in a bad neighborhood. So and our bonds went up in 2008 crisis, 45%. Treasury bonds, 30 year treasury bonds, and they're going to go up more than that this time. So you go to the safest places. Again, where can you get predictable rentals, even in bad times from real estate? And that's from apartments and multifamily. And where are the best bonds that will be paid no matter what? When every all financial assets have to go. Now, here's my number from 600 trillion worldwide. They're going to have to come back down to about 250 to 300 trillion. Now, think about that globally. 
three times global GDP 95, 300 trillion dollars, give or take, disappears in financial assets. So as long as you're protected from that in the right real estate and in the right bonds, the highest quality, the longest term. If I could buy one thing, it'd be 30 year treasury bond. Okay, U.S. government. U.S., not Tanzania. <laughs> not even Europe. Europe has much worse demographics. It's already been slower than us. U.S. as a developed country is going to come out of this after a damn near short-term depression, the best. And our millennial generation, Europe doesn't have one, by the way. It's going to be the best in the developed world. So we come out of this better. Our U.S. Treasury bonds, 30-year Treasury bonds would be my number one right now. Right. You said something. Why doesn't Europe have a millennial? What happened there? Because they're older. They've been around longer. They've been richer longer. And the people who are rich have fewer kids. Poor people have more kids and rich people have fewer. We should promote rich people having more kids. But the natural propensity, (laughs) people that have a life say more kids ruins that life. And it's better to have two kids and be done. Poor people just keep having kids. When the crash happens, I don't want to hold 30-year treasury bonds at 1% to 2% yields or zero. I want to get back into the best part of the world. And it's not going to be North America anymore. It's going to be better than Europe. But Asia is going to be better than North America and continue to be. There's nothing simpler than demographic than that. We're better than Europe in the developed world. And as things move forward, all the growth is going to be in Asia, East Asia going towards India, which after I die will be the richest, greatest, largest country. When interest rates were coming down, the price of bonds were going up or something like that? When there's, yeah. Why is that? Because if you locked in, a, like, say, a 5% 30-year treasury bond and yields now move down to 2% because of lower inflation, oh, who's worth more, your 5% 30-year treasury bond or the new 2%? Your 30-year is worth a lot more now. So okay. bonds appreciate when inflation comes down, especially long... It is interesting to study other places that have had, you know, inflation and crashes. I mean, I keep seeing people say this is going to turn into hyperinflation. No, it's not going to take much more inflation. It's already crimping our economy and bonds and stuff. And that's already going to lead to a downturn. I'm telling you, when we see this downturn, I think we're already into it. It's already starting now. Inflation will disappear at 9.1% or 10% of it gets the height and never appear in the rest of our lifetime. That's a forecast. Wow. You never see inflation above a few percent for the rest of all of our lifetimes, even if you're 20 years old. Today. That's my forecast. Because inflation was the major baby boom, and that caused a huge inflation. And you know what follows huge inflation? The disinflation and the boom that follows from that generation that caused it, and blah, 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 blah. We're not going to ever worry about inflation in the developed world again. Hey, maybe Zimbabwe, maybe Africa, but we will never, inflation, high inflation will never be a topic. After. That's fantastic insight. Anyway, one more thing about booms and busts. What Harry's saying about the 30-year is basically you're getting ready to pick up more product, whatever it is. So it's the same as us. We don't buy real estate when it's high. We buy it when it's low. The point here is that it's when you buy, not when you sell. And the reason I think a lot of real estate guys are going to get crushed are the flippers because they still expect the price of real estate to go up. So they're flipping the family home or they're taking out second mortgages on their home because the so-called value of the property went up. But real estate is also supply and demand. There's a huge shortfall of real estate in America. Demand is going up. So that's why residential is good as incomes come down. I mean, apartment houses are great because people are backing into apartment houses. Take this seriously. We've had so many corrections now, and we've had this boom go since 1982 now. And even when it should have gotten a lot worse in the last decade, they propped it up. Be serious. You cannot have something for nothing economics work forever. And the fact that after the $10 trillion in combined fiscal and monetary stimulus in two years after COVID, we are already falling in a recession again. If that doesn't tell you something's wrong, you better wake up.